Uh, my name is Jason Steffen. I'm an assistant professor in the physics department at UNLV. Uh, I've been a physics professor at UNLV for about three years now. This is my third academic year. So before that, I was a research professor at Northwestern University uh, near Chicago, um, where most of my job there, well, all of my job there was doing research rather than teaching. So the research that I do is related to exoplanets. These are planets that orbit other stars. Yeah, so I was a member of the science team for NASA's Kepler mission, um, and it would detect the planets, and my job was to study the dynamics of the planets in the system, see how the planets interacted with each other. Uh, so I became interested in physics kind of as a, kind of by accident. Uh, I didn't like physics in high school. It was one of my least favorite classes. Um, but I did like science in general, and I thought that I would be, I, I guess I didn't blame physics for being an uninteresting high school class. Um, so fortunately. And I was, thought I was going to be an aerospace engineer and I went from that to, they didn't have aerospace engineering where I went to school so I had an astronomy class my first semester, or first quarter actually, and um, that got me interested in astronomy but they didn't have astronomy either so I just physics was what was left over and um, I don't regret it. Everyone, I think it's the best major. <laughs> Yeah, so I was a double major in physics and mathematics. For a while, I was a double major in physics and history, because I history is my hobby. It's what I do in my spare time. Um, and But the two majors were so separate, so different in what was expected. They, they didn't reinforce each other, where a math major um, is very similar to a, many of the same classes that you take to be a physics major. You also have to take to be a math major, so um, it made it easier to double major in physics and math. Um, so earlier um, I had shown you an article by Susan Fowler. She worked for Uber and uh, wrote about her experiences with what she said were the, was the sexist culture there. Um, she also was a self-taught computer programmer and wrote an article entitled, If Susan Can Learn Physics, So Can You. Um, and then I also showed you um, that video of Hillary Andal as a teenager from the Philippines who, you know, tackled the weighty topic of relativity in a YouTube video and she ended up winning like $250,000 for her efforts. Um, I wanted to ask you, can anyone learn physics? I think anyone can learn, a anyone can learn physics in the sense that I believe anyone can improve themselves. Anyone can learn, take where they are and learn something more uh, from there. That doesn't mean that everyone's necessarily going to become Richard Feynman or Albert Einstein or Isaac Newton, um, but everyone can learn more about the world around them, and physics is the description of the world around them. So can anyone learn math? I think that uh, the same, that applies to any subject. I think anyone can take where they are and improve upon it and, gets, and learn something else. One of the challenges that people have with math is that all of the interesting stuff they put off until you're a senior in college. And there's so much interesting math that's out there that would be accessible to third graders and second graders and middle schoolers, um, but it's not part of the math curriculum and so they never see it. They don't see it until they've somehow managed to get all the way into their third year of um, mathematics in college and then the interesting stuff comes out. Yeah, one of the interesting things about math, uh, one of the things that I think is interesting about math is topology and that's basically like how are surfaces and regions of space related to each other? Can, is it possible to map from one thing onto another? So for example, there are a number of different ways that you can project the surface of the Earth into, onto a flat surface, you know, like onto a piece of paper. Um, and topology shows you how to map from a round globe onto a flat sheet. Um, it also, I mean, that's the beginnings of it. There's other things that topology can show you, for example, um, the fact that a coffee mug and a donut have the same topology. Um, if you, you can continuously morph a coffee mug and turn it into a donut because it's got one hole, you know, it's a toroid. You can have two things that appear to be unrelated but in fact are identical um, under topology that gives you the transformation between the two. Um, so I was working, I was, I was working with this postdoc. Uh, postdoc is like a medical resident where you've You've got your PhD, but you're still kind of a scientist in training. Um, and he had this really unusual, like a, a way of looking at like analysis, data analysis and uh, physical situations that was so different than anything that I'd been taught or seen before that it totally changed the way that I approach, you know, looking at different questions 
um, you know, he would talk about it, it's not actually numbers with units to them that matter, it's, it's unitless ratios that matter the most. Um, so if you see some physical, if you see some change in, in the behavior of some system, um, it's not because of some quantity that has units. Like, you know, an, an example would be, you know, the happiness curve, where if you earn, once you surpass a certain amount of money, then uh, you don't become more happy, you don't become significantly more happy the more you get, and eventually it turns over. Um, and the reason is there's some other money-related quantity that when you take that ratio, you get one. And that, that ratio is, uh, that quantity, like when, when, as you get more money, your happiness increases, and then it levels off. Where it levels off is basically the cost of living. Um, and so if you take the amount of money you earn and divide by the cost of living, where that's equal to one is where um, your happiness will level off as you get more and more money after that. I remember you taught us that, um, that if you want to plot, um, you know, like a, a, a graph, that the most important thing to look at is where the, the slope changes. Yeah. And, and that was, it was him basically that taught me to look at things in that, in that way. Well, so one of the things that I think is, I find very interesting, and I think other people also, it, it's awe-inspiring to note that the sun shines because of the smallest microscopic interactions that you can have between particles, um, at least you know in the universe as it is now. So you have two protons come together. They come they come together with just enough speed that occasionally they'll stick, and when they do that, they emit some radiation and some particles, and that heats up the environment around them, um, and then that ends up heating up the sun, and then the sun shines, and it's these tiny tiny particles. There are more particles like these particles are so small that um, if you were to pile them up uh, like in a spoon or something like that, there would be more of those particles than there would be grains of sand on the earth. Um, you know, in a, in a single drop, there's more of those particles, a single drop of water, there's more of those particles than there are grains of sand on the earth. I mean, it's, uh, and this is, these microscopic processes are going on all the time in the sun, and that's what causes the sun to shine. Um, never underestimate the value of small interactions. Like, never underestimate the value that this, the microscopic things can have. Um, because that's actually, that's what causes the sun to shine. It's most likely, uh, given what we understand about dark matter, or at least what we hypothesize about dark matter, um, it's the sum of tiny microscopic contributions that actually makes galaxies rotate and clusters of galaxies hold together. Um, is galaxies are driven by the, su the minuscule contributions of um, large numbers of dark matter particles. Whoa, wait, I, I never heard this before. Dark matter particles, uh -huh. uh, they're actually have been detected? Uh, so, so dark matter particles, they haven't been detected, but the other viable options for what dark matter might be are becoming less probable. And so the most likely scenarios, or I should say the scenarios with, I mean, it, dark matter particles are either some things or other things. It's not like um, it can keep, it's not like it can continue to be something else. We don't know what the dark matter is, but the amount of available real estate for what the dark matter might be heavily favors microscopic particles. And the last thing, um, since I'm shooting this documentary for a bunch of film majors, uh, what would you say to the film majors out there who say, I hate physics, I hate math? Uh, you don't know enough of it if you hate it, because it's awesome. <laughs> physics, so for, for people who say that they don't like it, uh, you know, tell me about your childhood, because that's really where it probably comes from. Um, in terms of like you had a bad experience in fourth grade when you were learning fractions and so ever since then you felt like you never really understood it. There's there are different ways that you can understand these things. Um, and people, there are a number of people who are getting better at communicating um, like the real amazing aspects of physics and mathematics and science in general um, that I'd say give it another shot. Um, you don't necessarily have to relearn how to do fractions or how to do percents or how to do, um, you know, geometry. But there are, you can take where you are and you can learn a little bit. And I think you'll find that even if you learn a little bit, it goes back to the thing with the sun, right? These tiny little interactions are what cause or what 
make this amazing thing happen. And the same is true with, if someone says that they don't like physics or they don't like math, um, they should take what their knowledge is and grow it a little bit, and they might find that it's a lot more interesting than they thought before. Thank you very much. Yeah.